Good afternoon and a warm welcome to our session, The Green Deal for European Cinema. My name is Christiane Siemens from Creative Europe Desk Hamburg, and I have the honor and pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of all Creative Europe Desk media. It makes me proud to see how international our audience is thanks to this wonderful collaboration. It is the first time that all media desks have joined forces for an event that first and foremost meets the European Commission's climate goal, but also fulfills our personal responsibility. Cinemas have had a very difficult time due to the COVID crisis and the increasing competition with streaming platforms. But today we are touching on a different topic. We will focus on possible contribution to a more sustainable environment. And I would like to emphasize, and this is really important to me, that it is not about imposing even more obligation on cinema operators, but primarily about informing you about opportunities to save money and at the same time make cinemas more environmentally friendly. We are delighted to have secured an extremely experienced panel and exhibitors from different countries who will present best practices in their houses. Birgit Heitzig, who curated today's program, will introduce the panelists later. Birgit has been a pioneer of sustainable measures in the audiovisual industry for many years. She's the author of the Green Cinema Handbook and Green Cinema Consultant of the German Federal Film Board. Thank you very much, Birgit, for initiating and moderating this event. But first, I'm very pleased and grateful to welcome Lucia Ricalde, head of the media program at the European Commission. Lucia has put a strong focus on implementing sustainable measures in every media funding scheme. Herewith, she underlines the EU's requirement to devote 30% of all funding to the climate. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Lucia, for being with us today and opening this session. But before I hand over the screen to Lucia, please allow me two words on housekeeping, which are the usual announcements. Please mute yourself, turn off your camera, open the speakers mode, and note that this session will be recorded. You are mostly welcome to ask questions in the chat, which will be answered after the panel discussion. And now I wish you exciting and informative 90 minutes and hand over to Lucia. Thank you everybody for participating and making this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christiane. Dear uh, Media Hamburg team, dear desk and dear professionals, it's really my pleasure to be here today virtually with you and open today's event entitled The Green Deal for, for European Cinemas. Because when the Green Deal strategy was presented by President von der Leyen back in December 2019, the pandemic has not yet hit our economies. At that time, sustainability was recognized a big political priority. But the pandemic has shown and intensified the importance of this topic in our daily lives. So today, the Green Deal, I would say, is a must is a necessity and there is an urgent need to take action as soon as possible. So I can only welcome the initiative that you are taking today because we are convinced that greening is part of the answer, one opportunity for the audiovisual industry and in particular, including for cinemas. So oh, I would like to very briefly mm, tell you in a snapshot, the measures that we have taken in order to put 
greening activities in the spotlight of our policy agenda and also our funding support programs. Greening is indeed a very important component of the media and audiovisual action plan that was adopted by the Commission in December 2020. And we decided that this priority could not be implemented by the Commission in a splendid isolation. It had to be implemented in a very close and seamless dialogue with the audiovisual industry at large. And this is what we have done in the first place. We have sat down and really tried to identify what were the files where action at European level by the European Commission could bring about the greatest European added value. And we have identified already two first initiatives on which we would like to take action. The first one is to come up with a unified measurement system for CO2 emissions. You know that there are a number of calculators in place, but they are not compatible and they lead to different results. And we think that there is really a window opportunity to try to come with a harmonized methodology underpinning the various calculators. So this is possibly the first action that we have in the pipeline. And the second one we would like, it's an ambitious one, we would like to come up with a recognizable label for green production in the EU. Uh, we don't have a dedicated actions targeting European cinemas in the short term, but believe me, we will be listening to you very, very attentively because your feedback is really essential for us to discuss how to take forward in a second step our uh, greening agenda with the industry, with the audiovisual ecosystem. Now, just a few words on what we are doing under the media program. We also decided to take a gradual approach and start introducing incentives in many of the media calls to try to trigger, I would say, a, a change in the mindset so that green it is understood as an opportunity, not only as a burden, as you mentioned, and something that in the end will bring value to our society and to our industry. So uh, we are now in the middle of this the incremental approach, introducing incentives from the, for the industry. We'll get the first results next year and we will be monitoring these results very attentively. So um, I don't want really to keep the floor for very long. Um, I'm really looking forward to these exchanges. This audiovisual industry has shown that it can play a very, very important role in really uh, awakening our societies. We have the example of the Me Too movement, and I'm sure that with the work you are doing, especially today, the cinema exhibitors, that can really make a difference, uh, not only uh, for you as cinemas, as part of the audiovisual industry, but for the citizens and the society at large. So I wish you really a very inspiring discussion and hope to see many of you in person as soon as possible and latest in Berlinale. Bye, bye-bye. Thank you very much, Lucia, for this great and interesting and inspiring keynote address. And wel welcome everybody to the Green Deal for European Cinema Conference. So as Lucia said, um, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announced really an ambitious roadmap for a climate neutral continent in 2050. Uh, various Green Deal targets are already tackled in the EU regulations and directives, which also affect cinemas, but also other enterprises. Uh, today, we want to discuss what these guidelines actually mean for cinemas. Furthermore, we invited several exhibitors to present measures that they are already taking as examples of best practice. So now first slide, please. So what is green cinema? It means to operate cinemas more environmentally friendly. It's all about energy efficiency, renewables, sustainable concession products, and waste management. The efficient use of energy and the use of renewables offer opportunities to cut cost. In the cinema, the digitization led to a tremendous increase 
in energy cost and the energy costs keep going up also recently with the carbon pricing. Next slide. Cinemas have large screening spaces that must be heated and cooled. More efficient use of power, heat and air conditioning can radically cut energy costs. The most environmentally friendly energy is the one that we don't use. Therefore, energy efficiency is really crucial. And so it's possible to undertake an evaluation of the facility and to identify where potential savings exist. Uh, cinemas can also cut waste. So in a multiplex cinema, over the course of a year, about a million disposable cups are giving out at the concession stand. Instead, it's possible to serve drinks in glasses and snacks on reusable plates. More and more cinema goers prefer eco-friendly solutions. Next slide, please. Various guidelines in the EU require measures that also exhibitors have to take or may have to take soon. As for example, the Directive for Energy Performance of Buildings. It's about reducing the carbon footprint of buildings. The buildings in the European Union are responsible for about 40% of the energy consumption and 36% carbon emissions in the EU. Every third building is more than 50 years old. Next slide, please. The Eco Design Directive is supposed to put an end to energy waste. It requires more energy efficient electric appliances and lighting. Next slide, please. The Renewable Energy Directive has set the target by 2030, at least 32% of Europe's energy should come from renewable sources. Next slide, please. And there is the Circular Economy Action Plan. In July this year, the Single-Use Plastics Directive came into effect. Several single-use plastic products are banned, such as plastic straws, plates, single-use cutlery, and beverage stirrers. Thank you. Um, this is the end of the slides. So now we want to discuss what can be done to operate cinemas more environmentally friendly. So we have excellent experts from Brussels. Uh, please welcome Lorian Bertrand, the coordinator for greening in the media program. Lorian. Um, also from um, the panelists need to unmute yourselves so I can pin them, please. So from the European Commission, we also have Paola Mitturini, who is the deputy head of the unit sustainable production, products and consumption at the DG Environment. And as an exhibitor from Germany, we have Benjamin Dauer, who is the Chief Technical Officer of Cinecita, which is the largest multiplex in Germany with 23 screens. So now we are, we can start the discussion. Sorry, uh, Birgit, Lurian, you need to unmute yourself so you can join the panel. Please. Lorian. Hmm. Lorian, you have to unmute yourself to join the panel, please. Otherwise, maybe you just start with the panel again. Hello, apologies, here I am. Ah, wonderful, Lorian. Thank you. 
So uh, I would like to address the first question to you. So many EU directives, they already require to take more environmentally friendly choices in terms of energy, material, transportation, food, as well as to avoid uh, any kind of waste. But in the EU member states, the conditions are very different in terms of the infrastructure, the know-how and sources for public funding. So how can creative media accompany this green transition for cinemas? First of all, what I'd like to say, uh, Birgit, is that no decision is made at EU level without involving uh, the member states, of course. So there is no possibility to play a, bl a blame game here. And second, of course, uh, the professionals. Uh, that's what we intend to do, as Lucia mentioned, uh, with the launch of our stakeholder uh, dialogue um, at the level of the media program uh, that, we, that was launched on the 30th of June. Um, we are extremely happy with the enthusiasts that the subject um, is creating among the stakeholders, among the professionals. But here also, as you say, we understand that there are many different initiatives and many different levels of action uh, for the moment. Um, what we see, uh, we think that our role um, can bring value if we are able to organize cooperation uh, the two first subjects, as mentioned by Lucia, will be on a unified measurement system and also on a green label. That's where we see that we can add value. So let's ask Benjamin Dower. Um, what are the actions which have a huge impact that exhibitors can take to reduce their carbon footprint in cinemas? Of course, there are uh, a lot of things you can do for a large cinema complex like ours. It was uh, energy consumption. So to really reduce the amount of energy that, that you use every year and to get that down first. And then secondly, uh, to reuse uh, alternative energy sources, uh, like in our case, uh, generate our own local energy, for example. Uh, but the other big issue, I would say, is, is waste, because cinemas are generating a lot of waste, want, uh, a lot of uh, plastic cups and not reusable packaging. That's the other big um, thing I would say that cinemas um, need to work on. Um, now, I would like to ask uh, Paola. Um, so, on one hand, with modern energy efficient devices, we can reduce the energy consumption, but on the other hand, on the other hand, the replacement of a product often leads um, to hardware obsolescence. So uh, how can we, with a design for recycling strategy, also reduce hardware obsolescence that we can use uh, products much longer? Uh, well, thank you for, for this uh, question, which is indeed uh, quite, uh, quite tricky, uh, because when you start to speak about obsolescence, uh, you call up immediately a, a very large discussion on, in general on the provisions that we can have for obsolescence. First, we need to determine what obsolescence is, from which moment. As you rightly said, sometimes it's just a question of spare parts. So we are acting um, with different measures, in fact, uh, to, to reduce obsolescences of products. One of those is the Eco Design Directive. I think this is what uh, you, you maybe had also in mind. Uh, what we are doing is um, for a series of products, uh, for the moment only the energy related ones, so uh, washing machines or dishwashers or other electronic displays, we are requesting um, that, uh, for example, uh, spare parts are made available for a certain duration of time, so a long time than, than usual. So in order to allow a machine or an equipment to uh, remain uh, up to date, if I can say so, also with the energy efficiency requirements. Uh, now, not all the products are in included in, uh, in the Eco Design Directive, as I said, only the energy efficiency ones. And 
not all the products that you might have in mind or that are used by um, by cinemas. I was mentioning uh, the washing machines precisely, just to give you an example. So what is interesting for you is probably to understand on which basis we determine which product, for which product we have uh, spare parts uh, provisions, for example. So well, this is determined, uh, it's all set by the legislation that is determined based on a work program, uh, four year work program for products that have the highest potential for circularity, for example. But what um, is interesting is a measure that uh, we are preparing that is enlarging the scope of the Eco-Design Directive to other products, so not only the energy-related ones. And um, in these, or again, the list of products will be determined based on the, uh, the, uh, the possibility uh, to, to achieve a greater impact. Um, and, and some of those products precisely also foresee some uh, requirements, for example, of uh, uh, recycled content. So I'm thinking more uh, that it could be of uh, high interest for you, linking to the directive on the single use plastics and all this mechanism of measures that we are going to adopt to uh, reduce uh, the waste, uh, the waste generation in, in cinema. So it's not so much on the operation. So I'm thinking that your initial question on the equipment, but also as it was very rightly pointed out in your slides, which I really thought they were incredibly comprehensive of the whole picture. So very good for that. Really also looking at the, at the waste, uh, how to handle waste. So this, uh, there are several options, but I, I think maybe we can go over and exploring some of those um, in this discussion. Yeah. Um, well, as a new eco design directive, it uh, provides several rules, and uh, so they also improve the en environmental performance and the lifespan of products. But an important improvement is the right to repair, and uh, that should require manufacturers to make spare parts uh, available. So, so first of all, uh, let's um, ask Benjamin, what does that mean for exhibitors? Well, I think for now, I don't know how the, the right to repair, repair doesn't really um, extend to industrial products, uh, I think, yet. I don't know if there's any plans within the EU. I've, of course, this would be interesting to us uh, because it's, um, you know, an important part to see, to save your investment as well. And also sometimes uh, in cinemas like projectors you, you might be able to use them longer if spare parts would be available for example which is of course always a better option than buying uh, a new one um, that also always goes for things that you know need to be replaced and shipped and everything that co goes with that um, but I think the main question there is is there will there be a right to repair for industrial products or will there be some kind of um, um, uh, requirements like minimum requirements for uh, spare parts to be available in, in that area. Maybe I can oh, is there any hope? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe I can. I think, um, as, as you rightly said, so for the moment, the right to repair as it is conceived, it, it's, it applies to, to consumer products, huh? but uh, you need to see it. And, and, and I, you, you basically got it, the, the dynamic, and I'm uh, very pleased about this, that there's another way by acting on the uh, product requirements, you basically act on the right to repair. So it's not only, and this is for manufacturers essentially, huh? uh, for the benefits of consumers, but it's really something that manufacturers needs to take uh, into consideration. There's also another measure that I think you need to, to have in, um, in your radar screen as, um, as uh, one that would have uh, impact on uh, some of the equipment that, uh, that you're using is uh, uh, the, the directive that uh, specify restrictions on hazardous substances. And this precisely in some cases, this also links to the obsolescence that you were mentioning before, Birgit, because in some cases, in the spirits of circularity, we have accepted some derogation to restrictions of hazardous substances is some of these substances allow the spare parts of very expensive equipment to remain available for longer time. So there is a trade-off, as uh, often you can imagine, between the different measures. So what is maybe difficult to understand for the consumers or even for businesses is how all these provisions functions together. But in the end, I think that uh, you, you want to keep in mind the, the broader objective of the Green Deal, 
that you mentioned at the, at the very beginning, and the willingness to reach out to uh, stakeholders like the, the cinema industry, that uh, for us, uh, policymakers, is an enormous channel to reach out to consumers. So we keep an eye on your own uh, activities. And in fact, there are also the measures that you can um, keep in mind, uh, for example, uh, there are maybe less immediate, but um, certification schemes like EMAS, the ECO uh, Management and Audit Schemes, that allows for each organization to assess their own environmental performance and to improve it across the years. So all the measures that you were saying and the best practices that some, some cinemas already have in place would qualify for a certification of that type. So you, you look at how to green your own activities. On the other hand, I know from when I used to go to the, <laughs> the movie theaters that there is a moment where you reach, you have all the attention span of the public, and that is a fantastic um, channel for us to send messages about how to have better uh, sustainable consumption uh, habits. So the use of um, alternatives to single-use plastics and, and so on. So this cooperation would really deserve to be further explored, I would say. Absolutely. And uh, as, as you said, um, with environment um, management systems like EMAS, so um, it really makes a big difference because uh, if as a um, exhibitor or just as a normal person, if you really go through all the energy bills and you count uh, how much kilowatt hours you have used, what is about the water supply, how much waste you create, how much heating you need, uh, you get an awareness. And with an, an awareness, uh, the change already starts. And so then you can think about what kind of actions you uh, may take and uh, what kind of investment you may take. But uh, of course, every investment um, also in energy efficient installations costs money. And uh, so on, on one hand, there are exhibitors, um, they, they are also uh, um, the owner of a building and um, some are not, but uh, um, a huge impact um, has of course the heating, the cooling and uh, the air condition. On the other hand, it's possible to install solar panels on the on the roof, and all the investments they can pay off in uh, in a few years. But um, uh, the question is also how can exhibitors finance that? Um, so, so um, Lorian, are there any financing instruments um, in in Europe where can uh, exhibitors really reach out to and uh, maybe can creative media um, give some um, information about that or are there any investment funds we, 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 can't, we could think of or is this um, uh, not an option at all? Thank you, Birgit. Um, first, before uh, answering on financing, I'd like to, to highlight again that I share what Paola said. Uh, there is much bigger impact that the theater can do uh, rather than reducing uh, their own emissions. Of course, this is part of the game. It's also about uh, leading and acting as a role model. But here, uh, theaters are in a position to shape up minds. Uh, like Lucia said, we all know that the audiovisual sector with the inspiring stories, inspiring characters uh, that are uh, on the screen, beyond the, the camera, uh, I mean, many, many possibilities here to act. Um, theater uh, specifically um, have had many interesting uh, initiatives. Uh, was it on plastic uh, recycling uh, with the development, for example, in the Netherlands of a superhero? I mean, in line with the movies that the young people like, uh, development of a superhero that, feed, that, that is fed um, by plastic bottles. And it seems that it's a huge success. Um, this leads me to the financing. Of course, uh, when, you, when you develop this type of initiatives, uh, it, has, it also goes a bit uh, outside the usual scope uh, of the business model. So for example, uh, if you want to recycle plastic, then possibly you need some, some room uh, to store uh, this big amount of plastic that you would keep. 
um, and all this was not, was not necessarily foreseen uh, in the beginning. Here, uh, media will stand by the professional as usual. However, I do not believe that a special scheme has to be developed for this. Our intention is to, to have sustainability present in all the different schemes of the program. This means that, uh, for example, in the support uh, to cinema, um, it, will, it will be part two, but then uh, it is up to exhibitors uh, to introduce it uh, in, in their operation way, because we do believe that uh, its exhibitors are the, the best, uh, in the best position to know what will work for them. And before thinking of uh, extra cost and financing, when you mentioned the solar panel, well, we all know that's also, that's also a way uh, to, to make savings. Uh, interestingly, it's not only about uh, solar panel uh, to reduce uh, the energy bill. Uh, for example, some cinemas have developed um, natural uh, roof, um, which is excellent for the biodiversity, but also excellent for energy, uh, energy losses and it pre prevent uh, energy losses. So here I think it's a collective challenge and it's collectively that we will be able uh, to, to address it best and let's exchange uh, best practices and what work. Absolutely, we will have even a best practice example today from the UK where we can see that the uh, performance of a photovoltaic system on the roof is really increased by um, the installation of a green roof which works well yeah. together and there are even studies, so absolutely. So, uh, but let's ask Benjamin again. <laughs> So in the analog age, projection systems, they were made really to last forever. Nowadays, exhibitors, they have to invest in digital projection systems in order to present their films in 2K, 4K, HDR, uh, by a laser projector, or even now, um, Cinecita on an LED screen. So Benjamin, how does the investment in a laser projection system turn out in terms of energy? saving and in terms of return of investment and how long is the software for products like this supported well um like with a lot of new technologies um it's often you know it often comes with uh, energy savings it's it's rare that let's say a new technology also increases energy consumption so that goes, for example, for laser projectors. Once you have a laser projector, you probably can save up to 50, maybe 60, 70 percent of energy for the same screen, for example. So that makes sense. And that also is a way to refinance uh, the investment. Um, of course, it's a newer, more expensive technology. Um, so it takes quite a while and um, I will not go too deeply into this, but the first digital systems in cinemas were financed in a different way. They were financed by uh, distribution companies as well via so-called VPF models. So the new uh, investments we have to do now, we have to do on our own, uh, basically. So um, it, um, it helps at least that newer products usually uh, also save save energy and it helps uh, to, to, to recoup some of that investment. As for software, in that regard, it's a little bit different. It's all about standards in cinema. So you have to have a certain standard to be able to play a, a cinema movie at DCP or whatever new standards will come up. And um, manufacturers, uh, you as a cinema operator, actually you have to uh, ask the manufacturer to provide software uh, updates for your systems as long as possible and that also should be an important factor to in when you in deciding you know what kind of equipment you buy it's, you know how long can you get software support for that how long um, uh, the system will be supported how long will you, will you be able to actually play films on that so that's a whole uh, different issue but that's something you should look at and also you know talk to your uh, to your manufacturers about uh, what what their plan is and 
that comes around also with sustainability. Uh, again, you know, the longer you can use the product, uh, the better. Uh, one important thing I, I, I think also is that new projectors, they, they don't have reusable lamps. So laser projectors, they, um, they are, um, they are also more environmentally friendly in that you don't have xenon lamps or other types of lamps that need to be exchanged. There's no waste. So, you know, there's lots of things you have to take into account uh, when you invest in something new like that. And uh, yeah, I think that's an overview. Lorian, you, you like to make a comment to that? Yes, absolutely. I think that what Benjamin said is very interesting. Uh, we see that while cinema address uh, just the intensification of the digital transition with, for example, uh, the need uh, for new te technologies uh, in the theaters, it's also a way to be efficient uh, in terms of uh, sustainability. So here, I think that uh, there is an opportunity to address both challenges, that is the need uh, for greening uh, the audiovisual sector and also the intensification uh, of the digital transition that was already on. Um, additionally, I think that one of the, the challenges that uh, exhibitors uh, have to, to address, of course, uh, is the recovery after the pandemic that has uh, hit them very severely. And here, uh, these developments in terms of sustainability, they are also possibly a way out of the crisis, a way to, a, a way to invest, a way to make the theater experience uh, more attractive and, and unique. Absolutely. Uh, so now let's please talk about waste management. Um, I, I have a question for uh, Paola. So uh, with the ban of single-use plastic products, um, the uh, circular economy action plan already has a huge impact. So plastic straws, plates and cutlery are no longer used but in order to replace these products, they are alternatives offered for the concession stands, such as uh, straws made of paper or plates made of sugar cane. And these uh, so-called biodegradable products, they often come with a co coating, and but this coating contains persistent chemicals, such as the so-called pair and poly fluor acryl substances, the PFAS, uh, which are more famous like as the um, Teflon toxic substance. So uh, Paola, how can the European Commission address it when the solution uh, leads to a new problem? Uh, yes, thank you for this question. Allow me just to say one word about the investments and then the opportunities uh, uh, before. Just uh, remember that uh, the Commission is also setting um, innovation and research program uh, on one side, that it's not only for research, it's precisely for innovation, and it's not only, even if it's not determined for cinemas, you don't have targeted envelopes of money, but um, it makes available uh, funds for demonstration projects um, for circularity, for example. So in any given sectors or by any given uh, type of, uh, of beneficiaries, for example. So this is also some source of, uh, of funding that could be kept in the radar. And then at the same, at the same time, also the program life that um, it's more dedicated to environmental uh, protection, of course, but precisely on supporting circularity solutions. So depending on from which angle you want to address it, I think that the commission really makes available uh, several, several sources. Now to go back to your specific questions, it's all a question of, um, of assessing. This is why we also always impact assess our measures. And uh, in the different options, the, the final decision is taken to take the options that has the, the best uh, possible outcome. So it's a trade-offs. So of course, um, uh, you know, we, in, for the specific uh, measure of the single-use plastics, we have banned some products and only the products that have alternatives, precisely because in this weighting of, of measures, we would prefer the um, impact of, uh, of the alternatives than the impact of the single-use plastics items. At the same time, since you mentioned 
uh, biodegradable products, I think you ought to know that we are preparing a, a policy framework on biodegradable, defining bio-based, biodegradable and compostable, because these three concepts are very often confused and mixed, mainly because some products can can tick the boxes of the three <laughs> characteristics, but not all of them. So it's very important to, to clarify. And so in, uh, in 2022, we are coming up with, uh, with some uh, uh, measures. It's not uh, clear yet because we are precisely assessing the different options if it is legislative measures or guidance, but in any case, clarifying the, the scope and then the, the different definitions. So in that sense, you would see that some uh, products that qualifies for biodegradable they have to respect some criteria, but even those would be beneficial for some uses, even if they have an impact on the environment, but they would be better than a, um, a more uh, dangerous uh, alternative. So this, I, I think it's, it's quite logic, but uh, it's all in the implementation that it becomes tricky huh? because then it's definition standards of, uh, of what it means by regrettable. As you said, there are some products that are some hazardous substances that needs not to be in, uh, in order for, uh, for example, uh, biodegrade uh, without uh, um, negative, uh, two negative impacts on the environment. At the same time, we're really trying to communicate uh, and clarify that it's not because um, a product is biodegradable that it is good. Because in fact, we have also seen that with the, the label of biodegradable, people would be somehow even prone to litter, or in any case, it doesn't uh, sense the message that it's not because it biodegrades that you should continue littering it. So you see the, the communication efforts around all those measures, it's, uh, it's quite important. So clarifying the situation and the single, single use plastics has some bans, some um, uh, for some products, some uh, essential requirements. So some recycled content, for example, for some type of bottles, and then some marking requirements. So again, this idea of communicating clearly to the consumer what it is purchasing. So with these three sets of, of measures, we, we are addressing the, 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 the issue of, uh, of single-use plastics that we hope that are clear enough. As you, I think you remembered, the, these measures are already enforcing since uh, July. So they have been taken up in not all the member states, I must admit, mm, but uh, I think that uh, you as, a, as a one important stakeholders can also do a, a big, um, big contribution to moving the pattern of consumptions towards this um, virtues. Uh, <laughs> Uh, habits, I would say. So we count on you. <laughs> uh, thank you. And uh, it's uh, so good news that, that you gave us that you are really working on um, more specific uh, labels for biodegradable and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, one more question I just have to you before you, you have to uh, leave us is uh, really the Commission also has really increased the recycling rates for plastic, for uh, plastic bottles. Uh, they will be, um, they have to be collected separately. And uh, so um, this rates are going up and up and up. But uh, in the year 2020, the global plastic production came up to 36, 7 million metric tons of plastic. And so we still see it all over the place. I mean, of course, sustainable is always a process which can be optimized, planned, checked, and changed. But wouldn't it be just easier to, to ban plastic bottles completely than to produce them, than to recycle it? Uh, because also uh, recycled plastic is more expensive than new plastic, and so it's, it's difficult? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, as you can imagine, a little bit more complex than that. You cannot just decide on a measures. There's an industry, there are jobs behind, there's, um, th there are products that are actually, uh, that have a better environmental uh, footprint than others, because you need to take also into consideration the entire life cycle. So there's the weight, the um, precisely the, the greenhouse emissions uh, in the entire process. And um, what we have done is uh, with the single use plastics precisely encourage 
a percentage of uh, recycled content, for example, in PET bottles, I think it's up to 25% by 2025, and 30% of recycled content in all other single-use plastic bottles by 2030. So there, there's uh, in this in in the um, impact assessment, and so in the couple of years that we use to prepare a measures, we always weight these uh, these elements, and we have options, and it's experts and and years of of research and then calculations. What is really difficult is not only to determine the situation of the moment, but also the projections and the development in the technologies precisely. So the whole challenge is to have legislations that allows for several solutions and it doesn't block innovation, for example. This is also another uh, solution. So I understand that from one side you could say, well, plastic bottles are everywhere, they pollute, let's just ban them. Well, what if then you have <laughs> glass bottles all the, all the place? Because people don't understand that they, in fact, they need not to, uh, to go for single use, but for uh, multiple use uh, in the case of bottles. So in some cases, and this was the case for of the plastic strategy, we are not really having a war at plastics per se as a material, but we are really trying to focus on the usage that people do of each single product. So it, it's um, it, it's more complex, but I think this is what makes it actually interesting as well. And this is why it also requires you know joint solutions and, and joint implementation by, by all the actors. Thank you so much. Uh, now we will let you go to your next meeting if, if you have to. Huh? <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> Um, Benjamin, um, do you see a shift of uh, really uh, consumption of uh, cinema goers and the expectation how uh, products are served at the concession stand? Uh, to be frank, no, not that much. I think it's our responsibility to introduce new options um, and people take them. They, But it's not like they ask us for for it you know people still go to mcdonald's they expect everything to be wrapped in uh in paper and it's a little bit the same i think with cinemas to be honest we have to change the offering and people will gladly accept it i think and they will understand that it's better to have reusable uh, pr uh for example reusable packaging or to have just different options in in terms of what they can uh purchase from us but i think it's really our responsibility to to introduce it and and to show them you know what is what is there yeah ab absolutely but uh, we we also know that there is a whole jungle out there of uh, eco labels what is really vegan what is fair trade uh, what is eco friendly um what is um Sustain, sustainable and what is uh, biodegradable. Lorian, do, do you see um, a need to um, to raise awareness that, that uh, exhibitors, but also other people in the audiovisual industry, uh, that they uh, can make a distinction, what is really sustainable and what is uh, giving you maybe a false impression uh, of being eco-friendly, but being only greenwashing? Uh, do people need um, to get more information on that? Lauria? Sorry, I was on mute. So um, in, when you said raising awareness, first of all, uh, we, will save, we will spare no effort. However, I do believe that there is already a very high level of awareness uh, among exhibitors. Uh, exhibitors are extremely close uh, to their audience. So this is also uh, a special link they have and just the, the challenges um, experienced by by normal citizens they they do not ignore uh, them um as you were mentioning not all measures uh, are equal uh, in terms of their impact um if we simply go from plastic to disposable but greener disposable uh, cups or whatever uh, sure it's better however it is not changing uh, our approach here, what we, what we need is a real uh, change in our mindset. I trust that uh, we are on this way, um, on this uh, 
having sustainability as the first political priority of the Commission, uh, of course, uh, is an incentive, but it is also very much just a mirror of what happens in our uh, societies uh, in general. Thank you very much. So uh, now uh, we can have some questions. Um, if there are questions asked in, in the chat. Is there anything, Britta? Sorry, let me unmute myself. No, not that I can see. So no questions. People feel free to ask. Now would be the point, but there's nothing. But Paola says a very nice thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so no. So let's let's proceed with the case studies and maybe if there's questions in between we will address them okay so then um now we uh, want um, to give the floor to uh, benjamin and um he will present us um, with the best practice example, which uh, refers on one hand to the um, directive for the energy performance of buildings, but uh, also on the other hand to the eco design directive. So um, please, Benjamin, the floor is yours. Benjamin, unmute yourself, please. Yes, always a good idea to unmute first. Thank you. Okay, I hope I hope you can see this. No, not yet. No, Sorry. Not yet. Just a second. So there you go. Now we go. There we go. Okay. So um, I will I will do a, a short best practice uh, about what we did um, in terms of sustainability at, at Trinity Car, but uh, I, I want to give you a, a brief introduction of uh, of who we are and uh, what what our uh, main site, the Trinity Car, actually is. It's um, uh, it's a big complex that uh, comprises of uh, that's. It's about 20,000 square feet, uh, square meters, sorry, not square feet. Uh, we have 30, um, 24 screens if you count our rooftop open air as a constant screen as well. So it goes from all sizes to small, uh, from very small to very large. Um, Chinichita has always been an integration of um, cinema and, um, and gastronomics. So we have three restaurants integrated. Uh, cafe and cocktail bars, and it's all one big complex. So it's it's sort of like a yeah, a, a, basically a place where you can spend your whole night out, uh, just at at Chinichita. The uh, also special about the way it's built, and that also really helped with energy consumption in the in the first place, is that uh, Chinichita has been built uh, ninety percent underground. So um, most of, uh, of the cinema is hidden. We are inside an old historic city center. So that was the only way really to, um, to, to, to integrate such a large complex into an, an older city center. And we have always been very technology focused. So we have 12 Atmos screens, laser projectors, an LED screen, a, a PLF, a former IMAX screen and always been focusing on online services. So for example, you can buy your concessions um, online and have it delivered right to your seat. Um, so we want to make the cinema going experience as comfortable as, uh, as possible. And, but that also is a challenge. It's a very complex building. So it was a challenge to, to see, uh, to find out what we can do in terms of um, sustainability. And our main focus really was is uh, that we wanted to um, to reduce energy consumption. So um, we had to identify uh, the, the main power users, the main power use that we have. And we also had to think about what could, could we do uh, in terms of sustainable energy and and see what kind of actions we're taking. This was 
seven years ago when we started our journey. And uh, at that time, we used uh, 4 million kilowatt hours per year in uh, electrical energy alone. Um, so what did we find out? We found out that HVAC is, is by far the biggest power user in terms of energy consumption. Um, we found out that for our needs, um, a local power, a local combined power plant um, is the most, uh, uh, is the best solution for us uh, because it combines uh, the uh, production of your own power with also your um, heating and also cooling needs. So you can use the uh, extra heat uh, from, uh, from those local power plants uh, to, to heat and also cool our, our theater or our whole complex. And we also found that little things do add up on a, on a big site like that, every small um, pump or uh, light that might be on for too long is, is, is a thing that needs to be looked at. And uh, that is a very tedious process to look at all this. So what did we do? Um, we really limited the uh, HVAC uh, operations to the absolute necessary minimum uh, in terms of operating hours. Uh, we changed our HVAC motors from being static, so they only had, let's say, two settings in some case, so like, like low and high, to uh, frequency control, so where you can really precisely um, control them in a way that you have the accurate amount of air. I uh, will go into a little more, bit more detail on that later. Um, and that also goes to, uh, we'll, we'll go, we'll go, went into controlling the HVAC on a per screen per visitor basis. So really, since we not have all the data, we know how many people will go into an auditorium. We also know what amount of air we need. And by that, we can really anticipate in a way uh, um, and set up the HVAC system except, exactly for the need for that auditorium to uh, at a certain time for a certain show. Uh, we did install uh, the two local power plants. Uh, they generate up to 420 kilowatts of electrical energy, which is in most cases uh, all we need. Uh, there's rarely any time that we need more energy than that. We uh, added an additional absorber system, which can use the excess heat of the local power plant to generate cooling in summer. We changed all the lighting to LED. Um, we, for example, changed all the analog uh, amps from our sound systems to digitally switching ones. And we did a lot of automation. So turning off and on things when you need them or don't need them really adds up to a lot of um, um, power power reduction or re reduce of energy because it's just so many things that you need to take into account. Um, and this is a rough um, overview uh, where you can see what it uh, what the difference was. So we were able to reduce the total uh, energy usage usage by those measures by by forty percent. Uh, we were able to reach, get costs down by fifty percent uh, because the energy we generate ourselves is, um, is, is cheaper than the one that uh, that we have to buy and um, and also um, of course going with uh, the reduction of energy usage that, that, uh, that both go, go, comes down to around 50 percent cost reduction and uh, yeah we were able to uh, reduce uh, energy uh, consumption uh, down to 2.4 2.35 million kilowatt hours per year that rather than having to uh, to spend actually um, 4 million kilowatt hours per year and we were able to achieve this in about two two and a half years and this gives you a little bit of, of an overview of uh, the chart gives you a little bit of an overview of how um, uh, sorry uh, of how uh, big um, the impact is on different um, areas so you can see the uh, the light uh, the the, the HVAC one really went down by quite a lot, and it's just a big chunk of energy use. And that's really one advice I can really give is uh, to look at that for for other exhibit uh, for other exhibitors. Um, and just an interesting find. I will not go into a lot of detail with this. Is 
that uh, you can see two lines here. You can see the bluish one and and the uh, the yellow, the yellow one, and um, it just gives you an idea of the air quality we were able to achieve by just changing the way we set up the HVAC system. So with the old way, it would react to um, the air quality in the room. Let's say you start a show, people come in, and uh, in that time, uh, they sit down, they find their place, and uh, the system will measure the air quality constantly and will find out, oh, the air quality is not so good. I need to use a lot of power to reduce um, the air quality right away. And the way we and we found out that if we anticipate um, how many people will come into the auditorium, we are able to set up the system in a way that it won't use as much power, especially in the beginning, and will have a more constant power usage over the course of the show, because it is quite predictable of what kind of air quality you need or how much air you will need in the theater. It's a little bit of a, um, a, a difficult subject. So if anybody would like to know more about this, um, they, they can ask me. Uh, but uh, this is just an idea of how you can also increase the quality um, of your presentations uh, while just rethinking uh, of how to control things. And other findings where uh, we have this uh, had this IMAX uh, amps that use a lot of power, we were able to reduce standby uh, power usage by by uh, by by more than by around three kilowatts. So that's a lot. Um, we added a new technology which uses more amplification and more power, but using a digital power uh, uh, amps were all still helped us to reduce the power consumption. So really the switch from analog to digital amps is very complicated. And, um, and it's what we also find out is it's very difficult to control all this. So if you generate your own power and generate your own cooling, for example, if your local power generation fails and you rely on that to generate your cooling, uh, yeah, you run into trouble. So it's a new challenge, uh, but we accept it and uh, we uh, are always optimizing and trying to find ways to, to, to make it better. But it is uh, the more complex you're building, the more of a challenge it is because things sort of depend on each other in a way. Um, so um, other sustainability packages, I will only go over this because it has been touched before, is screener packaging, reusable packaging, uh, uh, reusable 3D glasses, for example, that's something we, we did for quite a while. Um, even more automation, so there's always something you can find that you can control more efficiently. And uh, something we did, um, or we are doing, um, is uh, CO2 compensation. So uh, for uh, our anniversary, I think 25th anniversary, we compensated uh, for, uh, did a CO2 compensation uh, on a vol vol uh, voluntary basis to, um, uh, to for, for all the plastic we used. And yeah, more, more laser, more efficient technology, that's something we're going to have to use in the future as well. Yeah, and that's it from me. Um, if you have any more questions, you can address it to me by email and, uh, you know, we can go into more detail. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you, Benjamin. This is Britta. There is one question from the audience that I would like to um, uh, address. And the first is it's two questions, actually. It's like, how do you decide on what your green priorities are? Do you have expertise in-house or are you guided by experts? For reducing energy, we were actually uh, uh, guided by experts. So finding out, you know, where our main uh, power uses are, we were helped by that. And um, it was, you know, it was a, the whole discussion about reducing energy. It was, it was really the first thought was, you know, how can we reduce energy? Because it was back then a cost thing as well. And um, so that's that's why it sort of happened at the same time. So by reducing energy, we also started our green uh, initiative uh, and thought about more things that we could do. 
Um, that's basically how we decided. So uh, we really knew that we had to want to do something with, with energy. And we share it with our public. We have a special uh, section on our website uh, where we go over what we are doing. Um, I'm all, I always believe we can do more in that. Um, but uh, then again, I also think we still have a, a way to go to do more. So, you know, you don't want to do greenwashing as well. So we communicate what we are doing, but at the same time, we are very aware that there's much more we can do. <laughs> but you see your cinema as a green ambassador or like a role model for the visitors? Mm, no, well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really go that far, um, <laughs> I, but um, we are very willing to share our ideas and what we are doing with other exhibitors and we are um, willing to learn of what we can do still and we there's a lot of other exhibitors or um, gastronomic uh, um, entities that do interesting things that are of interest to us, so we are willing to learn more uh, and we are very willing to share of you know, our experience and what we are doing, because in some um, um, subjects, we are very deep uh, into it by now. And I think we can really help others to, you know, maybe uh, identify some things they, uh, they can do as well. Mm. So in that way, maybe an ambassador, but uh, yeah, wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And we have two more questions for you. One's like, uh, dear Benjamin, have you estimated the reduction of CO2 from two 2015 to 18 through your efforts? Uh, no, wow. not really. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able, we were able to, to track that, um, you know, um, by, um, by using, uh, by using local power. Um, it's, 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 it's very hard, uh, hard to say, um, because, I'm not 100% sure of the energy mix we used before uh, 2015. I mean, by now we will we are only buying renewable. If we buy energy from uh, from our external source, we are only buying renewable energy. But yeah, to be honest, I wouldn't be able to say how much the reduction of CO2 is. But um, we are just working on it piece by piece. Okay, thank you. And then here, last question for you. Is it a solution to bring your own cups and containers to the cinema? Well, for, uh, for coffee, we are part of a, of a system that's called a recap. Um, so um, people uh, who come by, we are in the city center and uh, they want to take a coffee to go. We are using a, renew a renewable cup system where you can take the cup and give it back at any uh, at a lot of other points in the city or even throughout Germany so you know you, you get a cup at one side at one uh, cafe for example you can uh, return it on on another uh, um, um, company for example or another cafe or restaurant that's something we do um, with own cups I think it's always um a hygiene issue in a way. For example, if we talk about recap, uh, the recaps are always um, cleaned by uh, by the gastronomic partners like us. So we clean the cup, we give it out, and uh, and and fill it uh, for for the customer. And um, yeah, I think there's maybe might be some issues there, and also with you know the the the, the size uh, and. There might be an issue uh, in terms of uh, of the amount of um, of, of uh, yeah, let's say um, any kind any kind of product that you you're selling with uh, with own own containers. But uh, for example, for cinemas, we also go a lot with glasses. So a lot of our um, uh, drinks are available in glass form so you can take a, a glasses into the in, into the cinemas of coke and pepsi and something eh, not pepsi sorry <laughs> coke and 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 other soft drinks of course so yeah that's that's where we are going okay and we have one last question here for you i would say Birgit, huh? that's um based on your experience what would you recommend to small cinemas where should they start and before that it says thank you for the presentation very impressive 
Uh, I think for small cinemas, in a way, it's also about uh, energy efficiency. And I, I see a lot of small cinemas, they really um, often hurt from their electrical bills. So, you know, whatever you can do, uh, look at that in, in a way. And uh, small cinemas, I, I think, also have, um, uh, have very good ways of uh, maybe implementing reusable packaging, even even better than than we we can do that, um, because it's just a more controlled space where you can easy more easily uh, re um, clean and and collect things. So that's something I would recommend. But I also realize that it's all always for small cinemas about costs, and you know maybe they will not always own the building, and yeah very very difficult to give a general answer but yeah this would be my my two main ideas there thank you very much benjamin uh, it was such a great and inspiring presentation and gave us really a broad overview what can be really done in cinemas and uh, yeah as as you said there are also a lot of small measures that can be taken if employees just uh, switch off the light when they leave uh, the room or um, if, um, for, for example, you, you have some sensors that the light will uh, switch off automatically like you have. These are all little things, even uh, the coffee or the, the water heating machine, if it's still plugged in 24 seven, it consumes energy and it's just tiny. Yeah. But if you add up all these um, devices and the energy consumption, then in, in the end, it's a, a lot of energy and so it uh, can bring down the um, energy and uh, so of, of course it's uh, really crucial to uh, power um, a cinema with renewable energy but uh, so the first step is of course to sign a contract with a renewable energy provider but uh, uh, what we really do get is uh, the physically energy mix. Therefore, uh, it's, it's really good if cinemas even can generate their own renewables. And th that leads us to the next presentation to Natasha. Natasha is the sustainability manager of the Depot Cinema in Lewis in the UK. And Natasha will present us the uh, photovoltaic system, which has been implemented at the, the post cinema and uh, also the interaction with the green roof. Natasha, the floor is all yours. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. It's an honor to be here with such a fantastic international uh, group of people in one, one place, albeit virtually. So, um, I just noticed my um, screen, my presentation isn't moving on. I'm just going to see what is happening. Can you see that? Not now, but it worked before. Oh, okay, hang on. It's a presentation effect all the time. <laughs> Can you see that now? No. no. Let me try sharing again. Here we go. Yes. Uh, so this is a view from outside our building. So Depot is an independent three screen cinema and cafe restaurant located in the center of Lewis, East Sussex, set within the South Downs National Park in the southeast of England. We were built in 2016 to 17, built on a former warehouse and car park. 
We offer an innovative program of mainstream art house and independent films, world cinema, documentaries and classic films, along with special events, guest speakers and workshops. The venue serves as a focal point for the community. We placed sustainability at the top of the agenda at the point of design with priority given to using renewable energy sources and environmentally and socially responsible principles. We intend to keep our carbon footprint as low as possible through sound practices across all aspects of, of the organization. Today, I am excited to share with you two key features that give a multitude of environmental benefits our photovoltaic panels and green roof. Our solar panels and green roof take up around half of our total roof area and measure an area of 29 by 15 meters. We have 15 250 watt panels which have a service life expectancy of over 25 years. The panels are monocrystalline silica to provide the highest efficiency. The panels are orientated facing south and the inclination angle maximizes their output of electrical energy all year round. The panels generate around 3000 kilowatts per uh, kilowatts an hour per year, and we receive an income of around 290 euros per year for half of the total energy created, which we feed back into the grid. They only contribute a tokenistic 1% of our total energy use, but serve as an important visual signpost to our other features in the building, such as our ground source heat pump that are not as easily recognizable. We could have accommodated around six or seven times more, but we wanted to balance on-site renewable investment with being able to support biodiversity. You will see by the graphics here that in the past year, renewable energy represents about 22.8% share of energy sources that we physically get from the grid in the UK. We only receive 100% renewables if we actually generate that energy. So even if we use a renewable supplier, we will still be using an energy mix consisting of a majority of fossil fuels and non-renewables. Generating our own on-site renewable sources, for example, in the form of solar panels, ensures we are generating 100% renewable energy and helping to increase market demand. At Depo, we make a 54,800 carbon tonne equivalent saving, supporting a renewable energy provider, helping to make a reduction of about a third of our energy footprint from the grid. However, our on-site sources are scored at zero emissions using our cal carbon calculating tools. So onto the green roof. This is my favorite area to talk about. We chose an intensive biodiverse roof, which has a greater substrate depth to allow for plants with greater root systems to grow. It required significant weight support infrastructure and is made of seven layers for insulation and damage protection. We also installed a watering irrigation system. The lightweight 30 centimeter deep substrate is made up of recycled crushed brick, expanded clay shale and organic composted pine bark. The roof provides excellent heat and sound insulation above our auditoria and prevents excessive water runoff. These were elements that have already been mentioned earlier in this event today. The aim of a biodiverse roof is to replicate the ecological requirements for the local area. The natural habitats created are designed to support a variety of plants, birds, animals and invertebrates. Ooh. 
our initial 16 plug planted native chalk species has now grown to 58 different species recording in, recorded in our annual survey this summer. I have personally sown a small amount of extra seed, but predominantly its increase is due to help from the wind and the birds. As you can see, our roof is absolutely stunning. It is a real beauty to behold. I have to add that the roof has a piece of my heart on it. It's abundant with insect activity throughout the spring and summer. The flowers create a rich source of pollen and nectar, as well as providing an urban habitat. Ongoing maintenance is minimal, requiring the removal of any unwanted plants, such as small trees that try to grow, or trimming plants that impose on the solar panels. In autumn, our gardeners cut and remove a majority of the dying off plant vegetation to keep them from breaking down and adding too many nutrients back into the soil. We water sparsely for an hour at dawn and dusk during May and July, if it is particularly dry, using a simple time on the irrigation system so we don't have to remember to turn it off and on each day manually or um, waste too much water. Once established, wild plants thrive on neglect, which makes them a very attractive option for a busy team. Birgit has also highlighted to me that in Germany, a new study came out recently in which the advantages are pointed out that the green roof can bring down the temperature of solar panels so that they work more efficiently. Furthermore, plants can absorb can absorb dust, which can reduce the performance of solar panels, especially in urban regions. In the wider context, a green roof is helping create pollinator corridors to link up isolated and depleted habitats. 97% of UK's wildflower meadows have been lost in the past 80 years, with bee and hoverfly species declining by a third between 1980 and 2013. We have developed partnerships with local wildflower initiatives so that we provide seed for other local urban sites and our annual species surveys get added to our county biodiversity record. Next year, we are excited to have bee experts um, come to our roof five times next year to conduct pollinator surveys to determine the variety and quantity of bees we support. Aside from the environmental benefits, our approach also makes great stories to share. Our green roof social media posts are often more popular than those about the films we're showing. There can be cost savings and a significant reputational value. We are headed for climate and ecological catastrophe, requiring unprecedented immediate action. You could engage an energy consultant to scope your building and make recommendations on what renewables you could integrate. There are grants, definitely in the UK, to help financially support your energy project. Harness your outdoor spaces to support nature. Identify opportunities across your site. Our storage shed now has a green roof too. And home, the venue in the arts and cinema venue in Manchester keeps beehives on their roof. We all have a duty to create a sustainable future. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Natasha. Are there any questions, Quinta? No, there are no questions, except for a lot of interest in this wonderful roof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really <laughs> amazing. amazing. YouTube channel maybe that we can share here. <laughs> no, but other than that, no questions. Um, there are more and more green roofs also in uh, Germany now, um, also uh, of cinemas, and uh, they also play an important role because they can do an 
isolate insulate the building so in in the summer it's also cooling in the winter it has a heating uh, or warming effect and uh, furthermore since we're having more and more hard heavy rainfalls um, if we have a lot of green <coughs> roof, they all take in a lot of water and uh, this is really crucial because um, so much areas have been really turned into uh, uh, just stone areas and so um, therefore it's it's very it's very important but also uh, um, it's it's even possible if you have a green roof you can even grow some spices there and these spices uh, may be also used then uh, for tea in the cinema at the concession stand. Mm. So this um, uh, leads us to our next presentation. Wait, 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 Birgit, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, because meanwhile there is a question, I think oh, that okay. one that we can address now. Uh, was it very expensive? I mean, you had help from the wind and the sun, you say, so I think that was not so expensive. <laughs> Yes, that, that, that was the cheapest um, aspect of the operation. What is unfortunate is, um, as we are learning as we go, um, we have very little information on the financial return we're getting for investment. When our building was designed, um, we took on a whole package price. Um, at the time, we didn't have the expertise to to really ask for and interrogate the breakdown of, of the different areas so that we could then know how this was going to forecast and save us financially, um, hopefully, in the long term. So my short answer is the build overall was very expensive and we didn't, um, we didn't um, limit ourselves uh, at all. We really wanted to make a sustainable operation and we paid out initially for, for that. Um, so it is, a, it is a shame that we have, don't, don't have an, more information to share on the return for that. But for example, our new sedum roof, which is on the shed that I mentioned, that would cost us about uh, 1300 euros. Uh, and that is for a space that was is maybe about eight by three meters. I don't think that that's an excessive amount to pay for the benefits that we're getting uh, from from that aspect of the roof. So from now now on, any infrastructure costs we are pricing very carefully and monitoring and uh, getting to grips with the return of the investment we've made. Thank you. Um, yeah, there are also some funding opportunities, mm -hmm. at least in, in Germany, where you can really apply for uh, public uh, support uh, if you want to um, do insulation of the building and then they also cover the, the green roof and now also with um, the photovoltaic system installation that's also a combination but of course uh, all these support possibilities are very different in uh, different countries and sometimes in different cities and uh, regions but um, whoever does research on that is uh, hopefully lucky and uh, do that so thank you so much Natasha for this wonderful ins inspiration uh, Pleasure. It's, it's really awesome <laughs> So then uh, let's uh, have our next uh, presentation uh, from uh, Jasper Nikins, who is a film programmer at the Cinecita, again, the Cinecita Cinema, but this one is located in Tilburg in the Netherlands. And uh, Jasper uh, will give us a presentation on uh, actions and best practice examples they are taking at the concession stand. Thank you, Jasper. Yes, but sorry, we don't hear you or I don't hear you. I mean, you're not unmuted, but. Uh... But we see the presentation. We see the presentation, but we cannot hear you. We did before, so.
No, no sound yet. Hmm. You probably you need to change some audio settings. Settings. Yeah, there you are. There yeah. You are. I'm back. Okay. Now try it again. Uh, yes. Share the screen. Now, yeah. Yes. Yes. And you hear me? Okay. <laughs> I will start over. Uh, as I, yeah, as you told, we were based in the south of the Netherlands. Uh, we're slightly smaller than Cinecita in Germany. <laughs> we have uh, six auditoriums, but also we have uh, laser projectors. Uh, we all run on uh, solar panels uh, on the top of the roof and also outside of the city. Uh, yeah, you don't see it on this uh, picture, but we also we don't have a green roof. But we have a green wall, or at least we're trying to build one. Uh, but it's also uh, yeah good for the environment, of course. Uh, uh to have to have some green on your building uh, of course because yeah there's a big of lack of uh, um green uh, especially in the city centers nowadays uh yeah as a green cinema sustainability is of course one of our key assets um even after the very heavy lockdown we had in the netherlands which cost us a lot of money and had a big financial impact, uh, we still are involving and looking for, for new opportunities uh, yeah, to create sustainability. Uh, in the beginning, we worked with uh, closely with uh, Tilburg University. And very soon we realized that the biggest positive change we can make is to change the way we are dealing with food. So uh, uh, we have our Cinecita, uh, which is our uh, cinema, but we also uh, Risto bar and yeah actually our concession stand is the restaurant slash bar um, but uh, we provide uh, lunch uh, dinner um, uh, bites small drinks uh, whatever uh, there at the, at the bar and what we want to do is create awareness uh, like yeah, what we talked about this uh, today uh, but whether if it's with our films or uh, giving it lectures or we're giving workshops um, or yeah, how, how the way we serve uh, food in restaurants. And I want to tell more about uh, uh, that in the next couple of slides, uh, bit by bit or yeah, bite by bite. Um, first uh, about the packaging uh, we used. Uh, yeah, we, we try to use, uh, keep the use of uh, as low as possible, of course. But uh, during the lockdown, uh, we offered a takeaway and also food delivery. So uh, we had to deal with uh, packaging. Now our big supplier is uh, Paperwise, Paperwise Paper, and it's a company based in Weert, also the south of uh, the Netherlands, uh, very close to Tilburg. And uh, yeah, we work a lot with them uh, and their ph philosophy is the following. Uh, as you can see on the charts, uh, only 15 to 20% uh, of over the 16,000 billion kilograms of agricultural products are used as food. So billions of tons of waste remain. And as part of this uh, can serve as animal feed, of course, but a very large part is burned on site or ends up in a power station where it will be burned to generate energy. Uh, alongs alongside the loss of valuable raw materials and unnecessary CO2 uh, emissions, this approach creates environmental pollution in the soil and air, uh, such as ash and, and smog which is a shame because it would be best to uh, process the agricultural waste into raw material for paper-wise paper and also uh, yeah, paperboard and cupboards and bags uh, like you can see here on the, on the pictures. So this is a special type of paper, uh, um, yeah, created from agricultural uh, waste. Uh, the paperwise uh, is produced in factories in India and South America, so they also make a big difference to local communities. Uh, they also invest in education, infrastructure and healthcare. Yeah, and also the farmers, they get more value out of their, uh, what they generate, what they're producing, because they are buying all the uh, 
the waste actually, which usually be burned, to make this paper out of it. So uh, this is, uh, yeah, really uh, a nice way to, 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 to uh, use a new sort of uh, sources and raw material to uh, create something uh, very useful. And uh, yeah, this is uh, what we uh, make. And I see uh, the picture is uh, over, over the text here, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the impact is 47% is, uh, lower than a paper made of trees. And also uh, like 29% lower than uh, recyclable, reusable recycled uh, paper. So this is uh, something we, uh, yeah, we use uh, uh, at Cinecita uh, at our concession stand. Uh, as for the uh, organic food, um, we work with a supplier called a shop, which means a shovel in, in English. And uh, this is an uh, organic farm uh, in a village uh, very close by uh, Tilburg. And they work with a 100% closed loop system. So they only use what they produce. So oh, uh, they uh, produce meat, of course, uh, with cattle, uh, but with the lowest footprint as possible. So they only feed the cattle national grass outside, uh, no grain, no corn, and the cattle live in natural herds uh, with bulls, cows, and cows, like it used to be in, in, in nature. And they also let them graze in uh, meadows uh, outside of their own property in cooperation with national parks, uh, which we have uh, a lot here uh, in the surroundings. So uh, we at Cinecita uh, will try now uh, to uh, cook in a different way. In the old way, uh, you make recipes and then you buy meat. But now we buy a whole cow and then we think about, okay, how can we uh, create different recipes and uh, use this meat instead of uh, uh, thinking about recipes and then later on uh, buy meat. Uh, we also buy uh, vegetables uh, from its crop and, uh, and also a lot of other uh, organic gardens. But uh, we're developing now our own garden, especially uh, for Sinecita. So therefore we won't depend on the supply of the organic gardens and we create uh, our own uh, system. And also uh, we know the best, of course, when which products we uh, can use the best in what season. But we also cook by the season uh, nowadays and we eat from the land. That's our philosophy actually uh, right now. Uh, but still uh, the majority of our customers uh, are a little bit addicted to meat. <laughs> That's what we see. So we would like to change also the way we look at meat. So therefore we also serve uh, two ki different kinds of burgers. And it's uh, the Dutch wheat burger and also a cricket burger. Because we believe that plant-based food and non-traditional farm animal food, as you could call it like that, are the key to, to, yeah, to make a real uh, change. Uh, whether it's, it's the end of suffering for the animals or making our economy uh, sustainable. Because Mother Earth can sustain herself, as she has proven that for a million years uh, right now. Uh, the wheat burger, the Dutch wheat burger, is uh, also a company here in the south. Uh, they create uh, burgers out of seaweed. And the seaweed is uh, grown in a local uh, seaweed farm. Uh, so the biggest advantage of this burger is, of course, it's grown and it's not exploited eh, by an animal. Uh, still, it's very protein rich, uh, protein uh, rich, and seaweed uh, yeah, grow, of course, uh, very fast, only on sunlight and salt water. And both of them, we have uh, plenty uh, in the world. So this makes it very uh, sustainable. And uh, the other burger is uh, is the cricket burger. Uh, first, they uh, wanted to try the insect burger, but that doesn't sell that good. <laughs> so they uh, there's a company called the Crickery. And uh, they create uh, uh, yeah, flour out of uh, uh, yeah, crickets. And uh, yeah, they developed products with a very low ecological uh, impact, uh, similar to uh, the vegan burger, of course, but they have still have the, the high, high uh, nutrition value uh, equal to beef. So it's really tasty, of course. I tried it a lot of times, and it's a bit nutty. It's but it has the same bite as 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 meat. And uh, yeah, of course, the biggest advantage of the cricket 
at Burger is uh, insects, they use 95% less water, 85% less food, and 90% less land than traditional farm animals. So we really see uh, this cricket and insects, uh, the future of uh, our uh, food society. Uh, and yeah, that's what we also try to uh, uh, create some awareness of uh, with our visitors. And uh, also uh, what we saw was insects, uh, they eat a lot of uh, agricultural waste, uh, for example, uh, broccoli leaves, uh, which is always thrown away because cattle cannot uh, eat them. And uh, if we, instead of uh, throwing all that, that, that food away, uh, we can feed it to the crickets and also make a new uh, mm -hmm. a circular uh, system out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that loop system and, and waste management will, will, will be the future. Uh, and yeah, that's how we started uh, at Cinecita with, uh, with this uh, yeah, first steps into the new food and the new way of thinking about food. So, uh, stop sharing. So I don't know if anyone has questions or... Yes, we have one question. How, okay. how can we also use this special paper? It seems like such a fantastic idea. Is there an online shop? Yeah. Yes, it's called uh, paperwise.eu. Uh, they have a lot of stores now in also other countries in the EU. And uh, yeah, they're doing pretty well. I thought uh, Lufthansa is even uh, asking for uh, paper cups uh, from them. So they're growing really fast. They were founded in uh, 2015 and in six years they conquered uh, the whole uh, paper industry. So, yeah. Can you say the website again? I'll just put it in the chat. Yeah, I can put it in the chat. Oh, I can. Yes. Paperwise.eu with a WW mm -hmm. in front of that. And then we have no questions, but two comments. I love all this. Maybe not eating cricket, but the wheat burger looks delicious, what he says. And then not a question, just a comment from Benjamin, who, who we had before. Really an amazing and well-rounded, thoughtful concept with circular economy in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what? exactly what we would try to achieve. Uh, full concept with circular economy. It's very hard because you have, you have waste, you have transportation, uh, but maybe with, with more cinemas or more companies, we can achieve uh, uh, this concept, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Benjamin, uh, um, Jasper. This was really, uh, it was really interesting, uh, especially in the, the burgers, the insects, and yeah. this is something nobody has really, con really considered that much, I think. But uh, so there are always new solutions and uh, options, and uh, so sustainability is a process, and it's all about really, uh, I think. Um, also inspiring people and learning more, exchanging, absolutely. So um, this is really great. Um, the uh, paperwise case is also a best practice example, which we highlighted um, on our website, uh, Grünes Kino in Germany. And so uh, I, I put the address in the chat. If you uh, just uh, put in greencinema.eu, uh, you will uh, get to the site. And there, there are hundreds of examples, best practice examples and information information and videos on the green roof and so on. Yeah. Unfortunately, everything is only available in German so far, but uh, hopefully one day also in English. So I really want to thank in the name of all the Creative Europe media desk, thank you very much to Lucia, Laurian, Paola, Benjamin, Natasha and Jasper really for your inspiring contributions. Many measures that can be taken by cinemas also may apply to other companies and offices. Energy efficiency, renewables, waste management, and of course now uh, also sustainable food options and choices are topics that are going to stay with us. So uh, thank you very much also uh, to all participants for interest in this topic. And I really hope that we will to 
uh, continue to work on green cinema issues and even uh, may have another event where we can present uh, green cinema best practices. So thank you very much to everybody and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Birgit. Thank you, everyone. Okay, ich würde mal sagen, ich beende das Meeting mal.